Welcome on board. Please find your seat and feel comfortable. This is an exclusive flight to the Zygoma destination provided by Zyga Center's headquarters and Strawman Group. The duration of this flight is about two hours. During this time, we will discover the new Strawman implants, Zyga Round and Zyga Flat. Are you prepared for the most exciting online event? Please check your internet connection and enjoy these moments. We are all here because Zyga means more than a concept. It's a community of high professionals in zygomatic implants. With more than 40 centers worldwide, we are more than prepared to take our adventure to the next level. Thank you for flying today with us, and for those that are not Zyga centers, our professional family is waiting for you. Please visit our site after this event. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign. If you haven't already done so, please stow your carry-on luggage underneath the seat in front of you or an overhead bin. Please take your seat and fasten your seatbelt. And also, make sure your seat back and folding trays are in their full upright position. We will take off in a few moments. Enjoy your flight with Zyga Center's network. Good afternoon and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this private flight, Saga 001 Destination Basel. This is Captain Carlos Aparicio speaking. Our flight today will last about two and a half hours, and our estimated time of arrival in Basel is 6.30 p.m. local time. The weather is good and we expect sunny and cold weather at our destination. We'll be flying over exciting locations such as the Stroman Implant Company and we'll have the opportunity to listen to Holger Harald, Vice President. Before that, the mysterious Stroman Saga Round and Saga Flat Psychomatic Implants will be brought to light by Andres Montero, Global Product Manager. Today is your lucky day. Our co-pilots, Guy McLellan and Alex Fibishenko, are with us to share their experience with the new implants. Any questions should be shared via the chat panel and will be answered during the question and answer session. Now, suppose you want to become a frequent flyer and get these implants. In that case, wait for the Become a Frequent Flyer session with the Strongman team. Now, time to act. Let's take off and go through the rationale for this innovation. Well, welcome again. Today, I'm going to introduce you how the SACA concept will let us, will support the regional for a new psychomatic implant portfolio. It is my pleasure to be with you today. I like to thank, first of all, all of you for being on the other side of the screen. I like to thank all my co-pilots, and team, and of course, I'd like to thank Stroman Company for having supported us in this special moment for us that means the culmination of many years of dreaming how to design, how to complete the Saga concept with a special psychomatic implant portfolio. My personal story on psychomatic implants started years ago in the late 80s when this nice boy, Ignacio Martinez, sorry, came into my office and asked us for a solution for this uh, maxillary problem. He got uh, oronasal communication after a uh, uh, surgery, a maxillofacial surgery, he lost all the premaxilla. Uh, of course, we called our mentor at that time, Professor Granemark, and he told us, please come with the patient and 
we were we thought that he was crazy when he made those long implants and placed the implants on the psychomatic bone. But it was perfect because we were able to screw a fixed prosthesis on those uh, psychomatic implants. So at that moment, I understood two important things that were a landmarks in my career. First of all, that a tilted implant can work because we were taught that all the implants should be placed perpendicular to the occlusal plane. And the second thing I learned is, was that uh, those remotely anchored implants were enough to withstand a fixed prosthesis in this patient. We have to take into account that, uh, according to Brunemar, the direction of the cytoma fixture was selected to provide optimal stability over prosthetic requirements at that time. So I will repeat it. The direction of the cytoma fixture was selected to provide optimal stability over prosthetic requirements. This means that the, it was quite frequent to have a palatal emergency of our implants according to the maxillary uh, wall curvature. But from that time to today, we have had an evolution of the technique. We have had an evolution of the paper reporting the safety of this technique. So from this case report, I was mentioned you in 93. For today, we have a uh, papers on 10 year report, 12 year report. And today we have um, a very good uh, um, randomized control comparative study that is proven that uh, proving that uh, uh, psychomatic treatment is more effective than uh, grafting procedures in the dentulous maxilla, in the atrophic dentulous maxilla. So now I'm going to refer to this uh, very, very recently published paper in 2020, just a few, uh, few weeks ago, from the uh, Marco Esposito group. This uh, paper uh, actually was uh, uh, Felice. Uh, as of the first author, where they were immediately, uh, where they were comparing immediately loaded psychomatic implants versus conventional dental implants in augmented atrophic maxilla. This is a three years post loading report. So it's, it's a good paper already, good results. So on the conclusions of the paper, uh, we can see that uh, psychomatic treatment is more effective regarding the number of implants that were loose, the number of prostheses that were loose, and the treatment plan, uh, the treatment uh, time of the, the total treatment time. However, they are remarking that uh, significantly more complications are reported for psychomatic implants since there was an apparent increase in severe sinusitis at psychomatic implants over the time. So this means that even today, we have problems with uh, fistula, with communication, with antrum, with the uh, <coughs> oral cavity. So maybe Felici is thinking himself, what can still be improved? Can we still improve our surgical technique? Can we still improve our implant design? So maybe uh, if we go through this paper, we, the first thing that we will realize is that they are not uh, taking CVCT after uh, post-operative CVCT. So maybe the number of uh, reported sinusitis was higher, even higher. But uh, another thing that you may realize when going through this paper is that uh, 78, 78 of the uh, um, implants placed were placed through the albergo. So this means that uh, only 22% uh, of the implants were placed in an extra maxillary way. So I don't know, but uh, this is something that maybe we should study more. The other thing that maybe can be improved is the implant design. All the implants were rough surface, thread implants with rough surface. This means that 
Anytime the implant gets contaminated, it is very, very difficult to get uh, rid of bacteria contamination from them. Uh, it took me many years, a stupid many years, till the moment I realized that uh, we all are different. And those differences in anatomy were grouped into five groups. This is the very well-known saga classification. And the saga classification led us to understand that we should adapt our surgery to the patient anatomy. So this is the second concept of patient-specific psychomatic therapy. Adapting our surgery to the patient anatomy is our goal. So this means that uh, we are not going to be always taking an intrasinusal path. We are not always going to take an extra maxillary path, but on the contrary, we will adapt ourselves to the patient anatomy. I'd like to introduce you this study where we were, this was a control study where we were comparing the results of the original technique with the SACA technique. The original uh, technique was followed for more than 10 years, all the implants, and all the implants of the SACA technique were followed for at least four years, four to seven years. I like to point out the big difference in the renal sinusitis results. Using a Lund-Mackay score, which means we always perform CVCT, post-operative CVCT, we find out that uh, on the classic procedure, about 54, 55% of the cases of the patients, sorry, were free of sinusitis. Whereas on the saga technique, 76% of the patients were free of sinusitis using the most strict methods to uh, analyze that. So it is clear for us that uh, when we are able to adapt our philosophy, our treatment to the patient anatomy, we get better results. So if the technique is giving us improved results over the use of the single technique, what is now, what we can do now to improve our results? For us, the next step was about the tools we were using. Implants should better adapt to the anatomy of the patient in order to escape for this kind of problems. So that's the way how we started to think how to improve those implants. Those are some of the first designs. And this is how we have arrived of today. The understanding of the anatomical differences let us to design a concept that says we should use a patient-specific therapy. In needs, anatomy, position, we should use a different surgical technique. And also this led us to use different implant design for each type of anatomy. Uh, so at the end, this is why I have today really the pleasure, the honor to be in front of you, to share with you, which is our experience with this nice, with this wonderful, I would say, Strauman Psychomatic Implant System. Psycho Round and Psycho Flat, and we will study how to use them today. So allow me to introduce you now at this moment a very important person. Mr. Howard Hader is Strauman Vice President. Uh, is leading this project. He's uh, uh, taking care of education and marketing also. He has years of experience in orthopedics. He's been in Strauman for many years also. Uh, he is today with us in order to introduce you this new Strauman Psychomatic Implant System. So please, Mr. Halder Halder, introduce your topic for this special Saga event. 
Welcome everybody. My name is Holger Harder. I'm heading Global Marketing and Education at Straumann Group here in Basel. Before I have the pleasure to emphasize on the why we have this strong belief in the Straumann Saguma project, I want to thank all experts of today's online symposium. As an organization, we are simply proud and privileged to collaborate with all of you. Today is a long-awaited day. Since years, our teams are working full speed to get this exciting Saguma solution to the market. So let me share with you why Straumann, as today's leader in implantology, is counting on Saguma implants. Over years, we have been watching the latest developments in the Saigumatic implant sector, and we realized that competition hasn't further developed too many innovations. This observation is also reflected in the strong openness of key experts to collaborate with us on improved, meaningful, draftless treatment options. Improvement for us means always having patients' life in mind. From this perspective, we saw that a unified but flexible prosthetic solution can significantly add value. Saigoma patients must be close to our heart and mind. It's hard to imagine what they often went through before getting treated with Saigoma solutions. Talking to many experts, we also observed a significant increase in cases. And as the Saigoma implants are seen as a kind of a rescue implant, we don't want to ignore this future customer need. Last but not least, thinking about how we can best serve specialized clinicians who care about such complex cases, we want to close the gaps in our portfolio. Talking about our portfolio brings me to another important aspect, the role zygomatic implants play in our solutions. The zygomatic implant system is at the intersection of two Straumann key solutions. Edentialist solutions and the strong need for immediate fixed solutions, immediate treatment solutions and immediate implant placement. As you are all experts, you know how much the Straumann Sagomatic implant system is the logical final step to complete our portfolio and to meet clinicians and patients' expectations of today. For us, this means having the patient in mind, it feels good to serve clinicians with the flexibility you need, be it for the surgical part, be it for the restoration. It also means that we can serve your needs end to end. We want to provide you with all surgical components needed to perform immediate implant placements. This will enable you as clinicians to optimize your workflow, make it more efficient and simply at best. We aim to be your partner of choice, your trusted partner giving you peace of mind. Collaborating with strong experts in this area underpins this commitment. Launching the Straumann Zygomatic Implant System comes together with two stellar important implant solutions which we launched within the last years, the BLX and the BLT. We received strong feedback from clinicians about the outstanding clinical performance of our BLX implant. Thousands of clinicians valued the unmatched capability to achieve strong primary stability. This perfectly complements cases with Saigoma implants. However, we also see the apically tapered version, the BLT implant, growing significantly and being a preferred solution for edentialist cases. Finally, our prosthetic portfolio with single implant connection seamlessly connects everything with the Straumann Saigoma system, regardless if with BLT or BLX implants. As Straumann, we are starting a new chapter with a Saigoma implant. But many of you are familiar with Saigoma's concept since years. Naturally, some of you haven't collaborated with us yet. Therefore, my last slide is highlighting for what we stand for, as an organization and as the Straumann brand. We are committed to be your partner of trust. We appreciate the strong preference of our customers to work with companies who continuously drive innovation without letting science and education out of focus. Our commitment to highest quality of standards is backed by the Straumann root and heritage. We embed digital technology to drive workflow efficiency and effectiveness. 
This is one of our key differentiators. And last but not least, patient safety remains at the forefront of our mission. We aim to ensure your peace of mind for all indications, but with special focus on the most demanding cases like zygoma procedures. Let me finish my presentation by thanking my team for their great job done. Thanking all speakers for their great enthusiasm and especially for sharing their outstanding expertise. And not to forget, I thank you all for your serious interest to learn more about the brand new Straumann Zygomatic Implant System. Thanks a lot, take care and stay healthy. Thanks a lot, Hagar. It's been a very nice uh, introduction of the system. I think uh, we as uh, customers, as a uh, healthcare professionals, health providers, professionals, we feel very safe having the company of uh, a company like yours that is uh, really committed to provide us with the best components to treat our patients. Thanks again. And now that's the moment to introduce you, Mr. Andres Montero. Andres has a very nice combination of uh, CV. He is on the one side as biomedical engineer and he has an MBA on the other side. So he knows the both things because he is the, the global manager of the product. So please Andres, whenever you are ready, you can uh, tell us which are the futures of this uh, um, nice uh, portfolio of implants. Dear surgeons, my name is Andres Montero, and I am a global product manager at Straumann headquarters in Switzerland. Today, it is an exciting day, as I'm going to present you the new premium zygomatic implant system that completes the Straumann Edentulus portfolio with an immediate, graftless, and predictable fixed solution for patients with severe maxillary atrophy, and enables Straumann to be a complete Edentulus solution provider. With a unique implant design and a straightforward prosthetic concept, our zygomatic implants will provide you the opportunity to tailor your surgical approach by considering the various anatomy types and bone deficits on each patient. Our system provides simplicity to you as well, and the system is compatible with our BLX and BLT implants and their prosthetic portfolio. It is also integrated to our digital planning system, Codagnostics. Now, I would like to show you a video to visualize for the first time the Straumann Zygomatic Implant System. It's been great, hasn't it? Personally, I really like it. Let's now have an overview of the most important design features of the two implants designs. The Strama Zygomatic Implant Saga Flat, the first zygomatic implant with a flat design, and the versatile Saga Round. We will go into each design in more depth later. First, they differ in the mesial and coronal part. The Saga Round implants has a round shaft and a coronal thread while the Saga Flat has a flat shaft and microcoronal thread. Both implants versions have the same distal design, as well as a common prosthetic connection and a 55 degrees platform. 
The implants have differentiated surface along them. They have a smooth surface in the distal and mesial part of the implant body. The surface of the distal threads is blasted, enabling host integration. Additionally, the two implants are characterized by the reduced diameter design along the implants, and distally, a tapered design in the thread for both implants. Both Saga round and Saga flat designs have a smooth, rounded apical end to provide less friction with soft tissue. Both implants have distal tapered threads for enhanced implant anchorage. Now, the design of the stramasagomatic implant Saga flat consists in a flattening shaft. This is very important, as it is the first implant in history with a design to best suit the patient's anatomy a bone deficit, thus respecting soft tissue vascularity. And it is especially advantageous for those patients with an overall smaller anatomy. Last, Saga Flat has a coronal microthread allowing bone preservation and osteointegration with bone apposition, while contributing to sinus sealing. Both implants have Additionally, each implant contains conveniently the same external hex prosthetic connection to a single SRA design for a simplified prosthetic portfolio. Let's now discuss about the wide range of product lengths available for each implant. As shown in the image of your screen, both Saga Rounds and Saga Flats are available in 2.5 mm increments. Specifically, for Saga Round from 35 mm to 55 mm, and for Saga Flat from 30 mm to 52.5 mm. We are very pleased of our implant designs. And importantly, let's look at the details of the diameters and threads designs. Both implants have this coronal, apical, and distal diameter at 4.3 mm, 2.6 mm, and 3.4 mm, respectively. The small, apical, and distal diameters, the smallest ones in comparison with most of the zygomatic implants on the market existing today, facilitates quad zygoma procedures for patients with limited bone in the zygomatic region. It also allows to have an easier implant placement in patients with a smaller anatomy, valued as well in non-quad zygoma surgeries. The distal end tupper design allows more torque control and proper primary instability. The thread with a length of 17 mm and a pitch of 0.8 mm are the same and uniform along the two implants. The 55 degree platform provides a straightforward prosthetic solution for you, as angulated abutments are not needed in most clinical cases, thus providing mechanical stability when compared to angulated abutments. Both implant, implants have a smooth surface in the distal and mesial part of the implant body, providing less friction with soft tissue, either in the intrasinuses or the extrasinuses approach. What is truly interesting is the unique in the market smooth and rounded surface at the tip apical end, allowing protection to the soft tissue when implant is placed bicortically in the zygomatic bone. In quest of a straightforward prosthetic cupset for you, the stroma zygomatic implants are compatible with our stroma and BLX and BLT implants for fixed overdentures, including the prosthetic portfolio, copings, and impression materials. The compatibility is ensured by a single screw retain abutment design developed exclusively for this system. The compatibility is rich thanks to the design of the interface platform for all SRA which is the same as the connection platform of all BLX and BLT prosthetic portfolio. We have integrated the stramasagomatic implants and prosthetics data into Codagnostics to allow digital implant placement, enabling you to use the stroma planning solution and plan fully at dentalus cases precisely and easily. The tool offers numerous measurements and planning functions, including automatic nerve canal detection, distant monitoring functions, and designing surgical and bone resection guides. We are working on an ongoing integration with many others available planning softwares. 
we have developed a dedicated instrument set as part of the Strama Zygomatic Implant System. We are not only providing innovation through our new implants, we have brought additionally innovative improvements in our surgical kit as well. Today, I will highlight three of them. Let's start with a new fixture mount. The fixture mount has a slim design with a less bulky head, allowing optimal implant placement with better flexibility. The fixture mount provides an important advantage when compared to those of a competitors making less challenging the placement of the implant in an optimal position. The set depth couch is designed with a hook end at one end point and a tip end in the other end point. When you measure the depth of this insertion channel with the set depth couch, you can choose the most preferred and convenient end point. We have developed new multi-use drills. The drills are made of stainless steel and provide top-notch cutting performance when compared to the performance of the competitor's drills. There are standard multi-use drills of 95 mm total length and a short multi-use drill of 71 mm of total length. Both drills have a diameter of 2.9 mm. Today, we have seen how the new Strauma Zygomatic Implant System proposes a unique combination of features to accommodate patient's anatomical structure appropriate for immediate loading. Stramon developed this Zygomatic Implant System in collaboration with renowned experts for a versatile implant designs to be used with any surgical techniques existing today. I really want to thank you and let you enjoy the rest of the event today. Thank you for today. Thanks a lot, uh, Andres. Uh, that's been really, really a uh, marvelous explanation of all the engineering and features of the implants. We feel really privileged having uh, you on the team. And uh, we cannot imagine somebody else uh, explaining better what are really the, the, the properties, the features of the engineering implant. Thanks again, Andres. And now, is the time to introduce you our first co-pilot. This is a very special person for me because I learned a lot from him. Is we have had a lot of uh, very, very interesting discussions. Overall, he is an excellent person, and for sure he is an excellent surgeon. I'm talking about Dr. Guy Maglellan. Uh, is an expert. Uh, surgeon on zygomatic implants. He is uh, uh, the Saga Center of Cardiff, uh, UK, and uh, is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in England, member of the Association of Osseo Integration, Dental Implantology. And uh, today he is going to illustrate us how he's been using for the first time. So it's very interesting because those are going to be the first experiences he has had with this new system of implant. Thank you for being here, Guy. And uh, we are just looking forward to hearing you. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, Carlos? Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for your kind words, Carlos. Uh, um, it's a great pleasure and honor and privilege for me to be presenting uh, some, some of my sort of clinical findings with this this new implant. I'd also like to, of course, thank the Strauman Group for uh, in, inviting us and for bringing this together. And finally, behind the scenes, both David and Radu for their excellent work with the the technical side, sort of uh, nursing me through these uh, these technical times. Uh, so first of all, um, as as Carl said, um, I'm from the UK. Um, we have a Zaga Centre at Cardiff. Um, and we're a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a fusion of both surg surgery and also laboratory side. Uh, we have a, an on-site laboratory and, and three surgeries with uh, CT scans, etc. cetera. Um, we, um, uh, I also work throughout the UK. I, I travel around uh, uh, providing zygoma surgery. Um, I suppose my, my initial uh, um, Introductions to zygomas. I was fortunate enough to be in the mid 90s um, 
and this was through oncology. And I suppose that was my introduction. I followed very much a maxillofacial pathway, and we used to use the zygomatic implants for uh, hemimaxillectomies, uh, et cetera. So uh, that, that started the, the ball rolling for me. So uh, that's a, a, enough about me. Um, I put this first slide up, and I suppose really this needs uh, no introduction, this slide. And, and in fact, as you're probably already fully aware, it's Carlos Aparicio's slide. Uh, I've borrowed this for him uh, from him, and he's already shown it as well. But the point you're putting up here is just to re-emphasize the, the importance. Um, it's the anatomy that guides us, uh, and it, it teaches us uh, what type of technique or what techniques would be available to us in any given anatomical situation. And this is the same for whether you're doing full arch uh, surgery, whether we can do all on four, um, zygomas, pterygoids, transsinus implants. We're guided by the anatomy. So I, I, I really like this definition. Um, so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna show you through some clinical uh, cases. Um, the first one I'm gonna show is uh, my first introduction to the, the Zaga implant. Uh, and of course I'm gonna pick quite a straightforward one because I want to trial out and see how it gets on, but also not be too apprehensive with the, with the new implants. So uh, the first one will be a, a type one, um, Zaga type one. And then I'll go on to a more complex, which is where I think the, the real application of this implant uh, is for me. I'll, I'll sort of disclose some of the, the tips and tricks that I found along the way um, and uh, why I think uh, this implant has uh, some advantage over over the, the rest of the field. But uh, uh, let's, let's go. So, so very much I'm going to be talking clinically. I'm, I'm going to produce no papers here or talk no papers and just show you lots of clinical pictures. So the first case I'd like to talk about, a uh, 72-year-old male. He's got a terminally fading end-stage dentition. Uh, and this is where a lot of our patients fall into this category. Um, they uh, have got multiple crowns, multiple teeth, um, and everything's sort of uh, coming to a, a, to a final stage here. Um, now, the important thing with this patient is his main key requirement is he does not want to wear a denture at any stage. And I'm sure all of us hear this repeatedly when people come in through our door, they don't want to wear a denture. So what I'm saying here is uh, serial extractions uh, with grafting was not appropriate to this patient. Um, so he wanted a solution that involved something with, with fixed teeth. And looking at initial uh, OPG, we thought uh, he was a suitable candidate for an all on four. Um, I'll run through the CT scan in a moment though. So uh, essentially medical history, he's, he's healthy, uh, a little bit of uh, hypertension, which is obviously normal for this uh, age group. Uh, so this is how he, he presents to us. Um, obviously, uh, there's been a lot of uh, occlusal decompensation uh, and a lot of old failing dentistry. So it's, it's reached its, its end game. Um, so although the patient has pretty much a full set of teeth, um, we are looking at uh, um, dentulating this patient and then seeing what options are available to us. So when we look at the CT scan, we can see on the patient's right hand side, it's a conventional all on four. We're able to get uh, angled implant in there, uh, just traversing or and running along the anterior wall of the sinus. And anteriorly, we've got suitable bone for implant placement. On the left hand side, however, there's quite extensive bone loss associated uh, with both the four and the, sorry, the five and the six there. Um, and uh, so we, we, look, we look to placing an implant, uh, a zygomatic implant. Um, you can see there's a, uh, a small mucus retention cyst in the sinus. Uh, this uh, wouldn't be particularly of concern. It may be uh, um, a dental in origin as well. If you see the infection associated with the, the end of that uh, six. So um, if you look at the positioning of the implant in order to get us in a nice uh, occlusally prosthetic restoral position, uh, we're looking at a Zaga one here. So we're basically traversing through the, the wall of the sinus effectively. Um, now, my preferred technique for this, which I've talked about a, a few times and I'll, I'll show you, is to do an extended lateral sinus graft approach, the so-called uh, intramaxillary. So the, the implant will be set within the confines of the maxilla, but extra sinus, in other words, outside the sinus. So I'm going to cut a window and I'm going to infracture the bone and I'm going to place the implant uh, outside the sinus, but within the confines of the maxilla. 
I then, for these cases, I then, uh, I'm, I'm grafting uh, both uh, medial to the implant and also lateral to the implant uh, to try and get uh, good fixed bone around it. So maybe not the graftless solution that we uh, we just heard about in the, in the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll go on to some uh, a more complex case later though. Uh, right, okay, so just to run you through the case, uh, we've obviously taken out the, the teeth, uh, cleaned out the infection. Uh, you can see the apices of where the, the six was there. Um, and we placed some anterior implants. Um, I then cut a, a lateral window, a large lateral window, extended lateral window in the uh, lateral wall of the um, maxilla and then fractured that. So I keep the, the bony window on to use that as protection for my as, uh, uh, sinus lining. We then go ahead and we prepare. And for this one, I wanted to try the Zaga flats. This was done uh, just about about a year ago now, this this case was. So it was my my first and earliest one. Um, we, when I do this, I, I, I wash everything with, with PRGF. I'm a, a good believer of PRGF and I use the BTI system. So uh, we dip the implant in some uh, fraction two and also wash out the, um, the zygoma itself with some fraction two. So we're gonna place the implant down into the bone. You can see buckley, we've got a nice uh, um, uh, a bit of bone there just to try and protect our implant, to try and prevent against uh, recession at a later stage. I think I'll probably draw try and draw people's attention to uh, the carrier. Uh, so the carrier mount of this implant is the same diameter as the implant. So I can place the implant now and I can have a look and just check I'm prosthetically in the right position. If prosthetically I'm unhappy, I can now drive the implant in a little bit further without needing to take away bone. Uh, often I find with many of the systems, you have to take away bone just in order to get the carrier mounts in, which then you then unscrew and throw away. So it's slightly sort of counterproductive to me. So we, we, we place the implant and again, with, with excellent stability with this very uh, aggressive style tip, Again, things I would say is that under under preparation of the zygoma is obviously in, important, and we use the uh, only to maximum the two point seven millimeter diameter. Um, so I'll go through that in a little bit more. Uh, so once we've uh, placed the implant uh, and we're happy with the position, we can remove the carry mount. And again, this is perhaps another feature. You can see this low profile excel hex and uh, so um taking up very little of the uh of the the alveolus there and putting very little pressure on the uh remaining um buckle bone which obviously is our area that we, we're concerned about uh, we can then go ahead and we've we've seen already the strauman connection so uh we can place our, our strauman abutment straight down on because with the head we've got a 55 degree angled head uh, it means that normally we're able to place a straight abutment down to that um, because we're able to advance the implant to get into a nice prosthetic position. So as I said previously, I, I then graft the site. This is with a mix of uh, bone from safe scraper, um, so autogenous bone mixed in with um, BIOS in a 50-50 mix, again mixed with um, PRGF with a fraction two. Uh, this gives us a nice easy to handle uh, and also it puts your growth factors uh, in the graft where you want them to be. Um, I then cover over uh, with a membrane, with a biogab membrane, and then this is the um, fraction one so it's the the membrane made from the patient's uh, own, own blood from the prgf so we close everything over and uh we need to close so we get nice uh crap nice mucosa on the buccal aspect uh, around our zygomas um, and i think this is a, re a really important area to make sure the longevity of, of these implants so again, I now put the, uh, again, just to show the positioning. Uh, so the surgical stent that we use to position the implants, uh, now put the impression copings on. We're gonna take a standard open tray impression. And you can see that by uh, advancing this narrow thin implant, how we can get it in a nice prosthetic position. Uh, again, maybe you'd say the zygoma is positioned slightly better than the conventional. We're now back into the molar site rather than the um, premolar on the right-hand side. And again, we uh, construct our, our immediate bridge, which goes in uh, normally about one and a half to two hours uh, post-surgery. And again, nicely showing there the position in the occlusal surface of the upper right five and the upper left six. So again, um, prosthetically driven implant placement surgery of our zygomatic implants. And the post-operative x-ray, you can see the bone graft, so bone graft both, both medially um, before I place the implant and then laterally as well. 
we then let everything integrate um, for uh, four to six months. And uh, this case uh, with lockdown was uh, completed uh, just in June. Uh, so, so we had a little delay in terms of uh, when we restored this patient. And uh, we took a CBCT as is now customary as part of uh, the Oris classification, just to ensure that one, we've got a nice healthy sinus, and two, when we've grafted bone, we want to make sure that we've got good areas of bone uh, around our implant. You can see both on the, the buckle, so how protective we are against uh, long-term um, thread exposure and resorption, with nice thick buckle wall there. And also again, uh, palately in that uh, so-called zygoma implant critical zone, how we've got a nice thick wall of, of, of bone there. So hopefully the distance between our sinus cavity and our oral cavity is greatly increased. So um, hopefully the uh, over ambitious uh, perioprobe can't find in, its way into the uh, sinus there. So uh, again, so we've got a, a nice vision. So we're happy to go ahead with our, our final completion. And again, this is just um, with the bridge removed, just to show the nice soft tissue. So we've got really nice um, keratinized mucosa all the way around our, our implants and our implant positioned in a, in a good prosthetic position uh, to allow for a nice thin narrow bridge. We now with all our zygomas are trying to lick everything up as rigidly as we can. So wherever possible, we're using the Pretow bridges. So that's the Zircon Zahn system, the uh, Phil Arch Mills Zirconia, because that has the most rigidity. Uh, and we think that's important for our, our zygomas. So everything's linked up with a rigid framework, so zircon's arm with uh, porcelain gum work there, and you can see the the underside there, the uh, the nice sort of uh, convex surface there uh, to get pressure against the gum, and then this is it in place. And again, you can see a nice thin um, you know, uh, FP3 uh, prosthesis there um, reconstructing this patient. So let's look at the second case. And I think, so that, that first one was more just an introduction to me and, and using the implants of which I found uh, you know, to, to be uh, uh, a, a very straightforward procedure. So I now thought uh, we challenged ourselves. So I, I used it several times uh, after that, but this was uh, where I think this, this case comes into its own. So we've got a 70 year old, uh, 75 year old female uh, who slowly over the last 10 years has progressed to complete edentialism. Uh, and many of our cases present like this, the really extreme ones. Um, she'd been wearing a complete denture, which she uh, really suffered with. She had a uh, quite pronounced gag reflex, so very difficult to maintain. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, it wasn't really the denture that bothered her. She had a lower partial denture, and she was perfectly happy with that. Again, medical history was um, pretty straightforward and unremarkable. Uh, so let's let's have a look at her scan. So um, I'm sure many of you in the group see these sort of patients on a relatively regular basis. So you've got quite good volume of bone in the uh, zygoma. Um, and as we come into the alveolus, we can see that uh, there's essentially no alveolar bone in this, in this case. So um, very, very, very much uh, just um, uh, basal maxillary bone here is, is all we have to use. So uh, our zygoma. And again, on a 75 year old lady, I don't need to, to say this because I'm preaching to the converted here, um, but grafting in, in my opinion wouldn't be an option and um, we have very little bone in the pterygoids as well so um, we planned her for a uh, extra maxillary uh, uh, quad zygoma extra maxillary because she had a relatively concaved uh, uh, lateral um, sinus wall so again we're going to try and avoid getting to the sinus uh, wherever we can so um, let's just move on so we're now going to go through the clinical stages this case so you can see Thin, atrophic looking uh, maxilla. Uh, again, to me, she looks like she's got quite a thin uh, gingival phenotype. Uh, we want to think about our, our incisions. So I'm probably, I want to ensure that I've got some plate, some uh, keratinized mucosa to the palatal, from the palatal pushed over, sorry. Uh, so I'll either make a slightly palatal inclined incision uh, for a case like this, uh, uh, or even just a little bit further over towards the palatal. So. Uh, on this, uh, I've got quite nice uh, um, nice if I, if I make a, a just off the mid-crestal on this. And when we raise the flat, 
we can see here that we've actually got quite a good thickness. So um, our connective tissue thickness at the crest is, is what's important. So we take measurements of this site. And we know with the work of Linkovicius that we're looking at over, uh, ideally over three millimetres. So we can see there's five to six millimetres of, of keratinised here. Uh, so we know already we've got quite good um, keratinised for maintaining our implant in the long term. However, I'm always going to be concerned uh, to some extent when going extra maxillary because obviously we've got the risk of thread exposure. So we're going to take out the equation and the risk of sinusitis because we're not going to go in the sinus. But our flip side is we're going to watch about thread exposure. So I'm going to try and always prevent this wherever I can. So we then uh, carry out a, a detailed dissection, just exposing the zy zygoma. And I do retract right the way around the back. So I want to see the implant going in and then coming out the back. We can see the very thin ridge here, so very thin and minimal. If I had a little bit thicker, I would try and preserve the ridge. But in this case, uh, it's almost non-existent. So I've got maybe one, two millimeters. So for me, this has to be uh, a notched approach. And hence, the, the, the Zaga is very useful here. Uh, so going through uh, my approach, uh, I make a little uh, landing zone uh, right out uh, beyond the apex of the, uh, the, the sinus uh, into the zygoma. This is just so I can visualize the underside or the, the, the middle uh, meat of the zygoma so that I know I'm going in the right, right direction. Um, I like to be able to see exactly where, where I'm going. Um, and then uh, use this very neat uh, fluted burr, which I think is available now on, on the kits. It just helps make sure you've got a nice uh, pathway uh, and also just refines the bone uh, along the pathway from uh, the crestal bone right out to the, the zygoma. So next we want to mark our, our entry point and there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Uh, so the round burr is the perhaps the traditional way of doing it and I know Carlos favours this uh, technique. I sometimes find that the burr kicks around a little bit and uh, when we're doing the upper one you've got to be a little bit careful because uh, you need to protect the infraorbital nerve when you do this so it can kick off a little bit. Um, so the other alternative uh, is using a precision drill. So using a precision drill I just find it gives me a little bit more more accuracy so that's the the other way of uh, ensuring here um because we're gonna get quite good ap spread i've got to make sure that um my apices aren't going to hit so i want to be reasonably distant in the zygoma we know from our planning that we can probably get quite a good distance between these two so a relatively although a trophic patient a relatively decent size uh, zygoma so uh, our preparation is is finished uh, and again, you can see we're we're not to the sinus, we're out into the zygoma bone. Uh, so now, so for our distal one, for our distal implant, we're going to use the zaga flat. Uh, so uh, this is going to try and press it up against the bone uh, and be um, uh, ensure it's almost embedded in the bone as much as we can. Obviously, there's quite a concave surface to this, so it's never going to be fully embedded in, um, but we want the flat surface. Uh, so we can then drive the implant in place, and you can see that going in. The aggressive threads really pick up nicely the, the zygoma bone. Um, so um, primary stability, even with the narrow apex, is uh, very good. So um, we drive the implant in. And again, now you can see I've removed the carrier mount. And you can see how the, uh, the very neat head of the implant sits almost flush with the crestal bone there. So it sits in there without being obtrusive. So um, the, the risk of exposure of that head is, is far less. And again, of course, it's got the, the, the polished surface. Um, we then, for the anterior, because of the differing anatomy, I would use the Zaga round on the anterior um, because you want to be able to tilt the implant slightly further forward to try and get your um, uh, screw axis hole as, as perfect as you can in the line of the arch. I use the round for the anterior. Um, so this is the Zaga round. So again, the advantage is using the round with the anterior, with any of you who've used other implant systems, is that again, the carrier mount is the same diameter as the implant. So as you're driving the implant in, the last few turns, your carrier mount will often hit on the bone mesial uh, to the implant. So often you have to trim bone away just to get the implant in. So this is where, again, the big advantage and taking it forward a turn or back a turn is not a difficult thing to do because you don't have to remove any further bone. Uh, so we place the, the implant and again, obviously prosthetic driven. So we're gonna be taking um, uh, carry mounts off. We're going to be looking at uh, our uh, restorative position. But again, we can see we've got a nice distance uh, there between the, the two implants, which again is extremely important for the long, longevity of these implants. 
So um, we're going to take our, our stent. And if we're ideally by tilting the anterior one just forward a little bit, we can normally come out and around about the lateral position. And the posterior one, um, probably normally around about the five position. To go a little bit further back to the six is sometimes difficult and the, you risk the tips of the implant hitting uh, unless you've got really good zygomatic bone. So over a call, I'd probably go uh, twos, twos and fives. Um, now, what I like to do is, again, what I said earlier, is, is prevention. So prevention of uh, thread exposure is key here. So uh, we've already said that the keratinized mucosa is quite good and thick. It was up to five millimeters. But I want to protect the whole shaft of the implant. So uh, a very simple, neat little uh, trick, which uh, we use for maxillofacial procedures, is making a small nick in the uh, perostium uh, just behind where the upper wisdom tooth would be or uh, um, behind the zygomatic buttress. And we could just gently tease out, and you want to make sure you don't uh, pull too firmly, but just tease out the buccal fat. Don't put under too much pressure. And you'd be surprised how much uh, you can get. You can't always guarantee you're going to cover a quad, but uh, uh, the majority will, will, get, will get quite a bit anterior. So again, we, we take the buccal fat and then we fix that in place with a couple of sutures. But again, not not tightly fixed ones, just sit passively over that, that side. We then go to the um, opposing side and uh, we're now going to do exactly the same. So we expose and we can see a thin ridge here, maybe slightly more favorable on the other side, but again, still quite narrow. And again, we then go ahead and place implants in the, in the same manner. Uh, I've exposed a little bit lower just because the cavity was slightly less on this side, just to make sure that I'm, I'm not going or penetrating the sinus. Uh, so implants are placed. And then we then go through the same technique of uh, mobilizing the, the buccal fat pad and then drawing that right forward up to the, um, the lateral incisor position. Uh, we then go ahead and uh, uh, take careful closure. And again, I think it's important just to, to show this, just to see if we can see how far forward you can see some of the buccal fat that I've tag tagged in there on the right hand side. So it's coming right anterior, and how we've got nice keratinized mucosa sitting around uh, our implants and then thickening up of that buccal tissue uh, over where the shafts of our implants are that are sitting um, extra maxillary. Oops. Sorry, I went the wrong way. Uh, we then go ahead and take our standard uh, uh, open tray impression technique and I tend to use a closed tray pickup uh, with the denture that we are going to adjust and convert for the uh, transitionals. Uh, so this is a, a one week review. So again, you can see we've got a nice thin, slim prosthesis. Uh, we have to thicken up because for this one we're using easy bar just to, to give it strength. So uh, we know that the positioning is nice, that when we come to our, our final bridge work, then we can get a really nice slim uh, zirconia bridge here. So um, just to finish off, uh, this is uh, the post-operative OPG. Um, again, as I say, this case was done now probably about uh, four months ago. Uh, so we're coming around hopefully soon to be doing her, her final work within the next couple of months. And I'd just like to take the opportunity of thank everyone for, for listening and giving up their time on a Friday afternoon. And uh, I look forward to hopefully meeting everyone at some stage in the near future when uh, this whole pandemic is uh, finally behind us. So I'd like to thank you very much. Okay. So thank you, Guy. Uh, I mean, a spectacular presentation, a spectacular lecture. I uh, really enjoyed uh, your abilities as a surgeon, as always. But uh, particularly, I enjoyed two things that uh, I think it is uh, valuable to remark now. The first is how much you care about soft tissue, how, how much you care about soft tissue preservation, how much you care about having enough connective tissue backally to the implant. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, it is amazing and always uh, uh, good to notice that a uh, surgeon cares about prosthetics. So I am uh, really like to congratulate you for this uh, magnificent presentation. And we will see each other at the questions and answers turn later on. Now Thanks. is the moment to introduce you Dr. Alex Fibyshenko. He is, uh, I would say he is the king of Australia and New Zealand too. Uh, no joking now, he is a very expert surgeon, implantologist uh, for many years in Australia. He has 
several uh, facilities, including New Zealand and Australia, of course. Uh, he has um, one of the uh, he's one of the uh, promoters of the All On Four concept in Australia. Uh, he's visiting lecturer at New York University College of Dentistry, and uh, today he will share with us which are his uh, first experiences with this uh, new uh, implant design with the Strongman uh, implant system. So please, Alex, whenever you like, uh, you may start with your presentation. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, my personal experience with, uh, with the Zaga implant. Uh, I've only really been using it uh, for the last two months, so I've got a fairly limited experience. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the cases that I've done. Uh, of course, I'm not going to cover all of them, but uh, I'm going to show you some of them uh, and the way that I use the Zaga implant uh, compared to the other Zagoma, Zagoma implants that I used to use in the past. So uh, the theme of my presentation is going to be just because the clinical situation is different doesn't mean that the result has to be different. When we're treating our patients with the Zagoma implants, we want to make sure that they end up just in a very similar situation to what a patient who's got uh, adequate bone uh, would end up. The next important thing that I want to emphasize is the indications for, uh, for zygoma. Two thirds of all cases are not fully dentulous. Uh, a lot of them are dentate patients. So let's look at some of the uh, indications for zygoma and the broader indications for using zygoma implants. So firstly, of course, we've got the severe atrophy when you have inadequate bone volume for standard implants. You can see in this x-ray how much bone atrophy there is. There really is no space for standard implants, especially in the back sections. Then, of course, we have the patients who have failed implants and who need revision surgery. And there is a substantial number of those patients. And you can see here the patient has got a lot of infections around her teeth. And when you raise a flap, you can see the implant, the 2-1, the, the, the has just fallen out because it has no bone around it whatsoever. What you see there is just raising a flap. So if you can see the bone defect in the 2-1 area, also around the other implants as well. But this has just happened as a result of that, of that implant being uh, infected. So uh, how are we going to treat this case? The patient's got a high smile line and we need to work out uh, uh, it really needs to be a, a properly counseled patient because we need to remove all of those implants. And here I remove the implants and I use the Zaga, Zaga uh, implant to, to, uh, in, in the posterior. Uh, you can see how it's got the polished uh, collar around it. Um, now the, the implant is positioned as though it was any other normal implant. And this is what the tissue uh, comes over the ridge once we've done the bone reduction after removing all of the implants. And of course, we finish it off. And then you've got, you can see you've got an improved keratinized tissue uh, because we manage the soft tissue at the same time as managing the, the bone reduction. And that is also important for the long-term stability of, uh, of the zygoma implants is when you have really nice keratinized tissue uh, around the implant collars. It's, it's easier for patients to keep clean because keratinized tissue is not as, as sensitive to the cleaning, uh, to different cleaning methods. And of course, we can use uh, the same type of, uh, uh, because the Zag is compatible with, uh, with the BLX, which I use uh, as standard implants, uh, it, it's you can use the same um, components on it when we take the impressions. So here we've got the peak impression copings and here is the finished restoration which is inserted the very next day after the surgery. So uh, here you can see the finished restoration and there is the difference. Okay, this can be a very subtle difference. For the patient, it's a major transformation. She had spent over $100,000 on putting implants in and ending up with a lot of recession with really unpleasant gum display. 
The sinus anatomy can also be uh, a, a, an indication for, uh, for an implant. So quite often that's why uh, you would use a goma implant because the sinus extends too far anteriorly uh, and then there is really no bone in the back for the standard implants. So we would use the zygoma implant and, uh, and replace um, and, and, and deal with the situation of the really pneumatized sinus in this way because our stability is really now gained from the cheekbone rather than from the jawbone. Uh, so here is the, uh, the Zaga implant, the Strauman Zaga implant being used. Uh, the same kind of technique, uh, a slot technique. I'm going to go over it in a little bit down the track uh, and show you an actual surgery. Uh, but the implant is positioned uh, into the cheekbone uh, through the sinus space. The sinus, of course, is protected. Um, the, um, and now we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and um, complete this case. And as you can see, the Zaga implant has got a, uh, a flattish surface on the buccal aspect in order to allow uh, to reduce the bulkiness on the uh, labial aspect. And again, we finish it just like with any other case, uh, I would finish it with uh, properly managing the soft tissue. This is critical for success. And of course, the final restoration. So I mentioned earlier, in all our cases, we do a final restoration straight away, simply because this is what you need to do in order to get success. <clears throat> and I'll show you a, a, an alternative as to what happens when you don't do that. Now, with the final restoration, it's very important to get it right straight away. So you want to have a cleanable interface. You want to make sure that the patient's able to thread a floss underneath. So you need to make the prosthesis thin enough and cleanable, completely flat underneath. And here you can see from the top that there's completely nice and flat and really simple for the patient to keep clean over time, well into the long term. And here she is with the finished result. So both her and the restorative den dentist were uh, amazed by, the, by how quick this transformation has come about. Again, she was treated with crowns and dentures and a whole lot of other uh, uh, treatments uh, by the dentist, got sick of them uh, and, and put a stop to it for a few years. Uh, and then she came back and had it all fixed with uh, the use of Zagoma implants because she really had no bone. Uh, so we used um, these uh, Zaga implants for her. Finally, you have the bone destruction from infections or impacted teeth, like you can see in this picture here. So uh, because it's, it's going to be very difficult or impossible almost to restore this kind of case without using zygomas. In this case, you can see it had to be a quad zygoma uh, with a midline implant, uh, not just a standard, standard zygoma. And here are the double zygoma with, uh, with the Zaga implants. So they're, they're also uh, very nice and very suitable for, uh, for the double zygoma. The flat side of the Zaga can sometimes be oriented in a different way to what it was intended. So why choose Zaga implants? Firstly, what I like is that there is a, a single twist drill protocol. This is very nice uh, to, to have that. Um, it's got a very narrow implant mount. Uh, the implant mount is the same size as the implant. And this is great because this means that you can put the implant deeper and sometimes the palatal bone can be uh, in the way. But when the mount is the same size as the implant, you can still push it through to the position that you want it to be. It's got a smooth surface of the coronal, which is great because if you have any kind of uh, re recession or any kind of dehiscence, you've got a very smooth collar that's going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be easier for the patient to manage uh, uh, to manage over time. And you've got a flat buccal aspect, and uh, that flat buccal aspect again reduces the amount of uh, uh, the amount that the implant protrudes through the maxilla, uh, which again is, is, uh, is, a, is a nice thing to have. It's got a solid apex uh, and the polished tip. So uh, when I spoke earlier about the complications with zygoma implants, with the old implants, it has the hollow section inside. This does not have the hollow section, which is nice to see. And it's got a polished tip so that if you go 
through uh, the cheekbones, which sometimes, uh, all the time, you need to do uh, in order to get uh, good st uh, stability of the implant. You have to go through the cheekbone on the other side, uh, and then you get the bicortical uh, fixation within the actual zygoma bone itself. Uh, so, so this is this is nice to have as well. And it's got a 55 degree correction uh, compared to a 45 degree correction of the old implants that I used to use, uh, and that gives you a little bit more flexibility not to uh, to position the uh, excess holes in the right spot uh, in order for patient to have comfort. Uh, the other thing that I like about it is that it's compatible with. BLX. BLX is my number one implant that I use. Uh, it has got many advantages over uh, all kinds of implants that I've used in the past. Uh, and the Zygoma implants, the Stramon Zygoma, is beautifully compatible with the, uh, with the Stramon BLX. So that means that I can now put the same restorative components on all of the implants without worrying uh, about trying to figure out which implant is which. Again, just because the clinical situation is different doesn't mean that the patient expectations are different. I'm going to share with you a, a case, a patient who's uh, this patient here that you see on the left. Uh, she's, she, she was wearing a denture and, uh, and she had really not a lot of bone left as you're going to see in the very short video that I'm going to show you. So we're going to uh, now see a very short video of quad zygoma with the Strauman Zaga implant. And it will highlight uh, the, the technique that I use uh, each and every time uh, when I do uh, quad zygomas.
So this is, uh, you can see here, it was a quad zygoma with, uh, with a midline implant. Uh, and this is what it looks like 10 days post-operatively. I took the prosthesis off to, uh, to show you this picture. Uh, and you can see the stitches are still there dissolving. They'll dissolve uh, in a few more days time. Um, and here is the end result. You can see the uh, Zaga implants uh, in, in the posterior section and uh, a BLX in the anterior. And this is the patient from before to after. This is uh, immediate. And you can see there uh, uh, how she looks a lot younger, even though she's got some swelling still, uh, she looks a lot younger, just the, the, fa the shape of her, ch of her face uh, has changed completely. And again, uh, this patient, it was very important to achieve the right result. She's very young, she's got a full denture, but we need to reach the right result for her so that she can uh, enjoy her smile and be proud of it. So just because the clinical situation is different does not mean the patient expectations are different, nor are the parameters by which we define success. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, immediate final teeth is one of the keys to achieving success, uh, with uh, whether it's with the zygoma implants or any other uh, full arch rehabilitation. This is the teeth, her teeth, uh, within 24 hours. Uh, again, you can see the positions of the implants. It was a quad zygoma uh, with a midline implant, but you can see that there is, uh, a, it's a thin restoration. Uh, it has got, it's completely flat. It's very simple to keep clean. It's going to be very comfortable for the patient. And in this case, in fact, we didn't have to remove a whole lot of bone uh, by doing any kind of major alveolectomy simply because uh, the body, the, the bone has already atrophied so much before I uh, even started. So uh, this is the, uh, the end of my presentation that I, uh, th that I enjoyed sharing with you. Um, I hope you, uh, you understand a little bit of, uh, of insight uh, from my experience with, it, with uh, zygoma implants. I do zygoma implants on a daily basis and I've done thousands, many, many thousands of, of implants and it's, uh, uh, it's been uh, really a joy uh, to offer patients such, uh, such great results and especially as the technology improves as we have uh, a better and better implant like the Zaga implants. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to offer our patients a broader range of treatments. Uh, if you like, even those who have very little or no bone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, this has been a really spectacular lecture. I uh, enjoyed the rehabilitation of the patient. I would say better, really, the transformation of the patient because this is more than a rehabilitation. I also enjoyed uh, the way you explain uh, why you were using this uh, uh, Strauman uh, Saga Sagamatic portfolio of implants. The reasons why you were using it uh, were very, very, very clear explained. So thanks again. And uh, also for uh, uh, pointing out uh, some of the extended indications to, for the use of Sagamatic implants. It's been a pleasure having you with us as a co-pilot again in this uh, Saga 00 flight. Thanks, Alex. So now is uh, my turn. I'd like to close this event by sharing with you two clinical cases where hopefully we will uh, understand which is the rationale behind uh, First, how to choose the right osteotomy. And secondly, by understanding how to choose the right osteotomy, how we are going to choose the right implant design accordingly to the osteotomy and accordingly with the patient's anatomy. And for that reason, allow me to remind you, which was, again, the goal for the original technique, and that was uh, 
brought in uh, the inventor of the technique, uh, P.I. Brunemar, which I had the honor to be his student, the student, sorry. The direction of the Saigoma fixture was selected to provide optimal stability. So that was the first goal, to provide optimal stability over prosthetic requirements. So our Taga concept for a minimally invasive osteotomy has as a first goal to reach optimal stability, but not only to reach optimal stability, but to reach prosthetically driven optimal stability. And at the same time, we like to preserve sinus integrity. So once we get the stability, we like to preserve the same dark color of this sinus. Even though this is very thin bone, we like to preserve it. Even though there is a very, very thin bone there, we like to preserve this nice black color of the sinus. And secondly, our equilibrium is going to be in preserving soft tissue recession, Pre avoiding escaping from soft tissue recession infection is going to be our second goal. Because what we really are aiming for is to install a nice set of teeth very close to the uh, real natural teeth. So having this in mind, we have to understand first which is the anatomy, which is the type of anatomy our patient has. And according to this, we will proceed. And we will choose a different type of implant design. So let's go first for this. Uh, uh, allow me to resume to group type 0, type 1, and type 3. And for this, I will use this patient. Uh, treated in collaboration with Dr. Pedro Huitian and Dr. Elena Lopez Alvar, Saga Center Vigo, Spain. Uh, when we go to this uh, X-ray, the first thing we are going to look at is this architecture. How much bone, how is the thickness of this bone? How much bone I have in white? Do I have more than four millimeters height? Do I have more than six millimeters wide? So I can proceed through this bone without caring about the sinus lining, without caring about mem uh, maxillary wall curvature. So we proceed through this bone and we get into the, uh, into the zygomatic bone. In this case, the curvature was uh, uh, not severe, but uh, a light curvature and then we can see the implant over here. So that's the previous patient. You see the treated patient, how is the soft tissue, and this is the nice prosthesis placing. And this is the saga round implant. So let's start with case discussion one to explain you how we treat patients type zero or type one. So as you may see, this is the right side of this patient, right side that has uh, very extended sinus process, process over there. And he has a big communication. So already the mouth is communicated with the antrum uh, from to the second premolar, first molar and second molar. There is a big hole over there that is closed only by uh, soft tissue, so this is the, the whole part, and this is our planning procedure. So we were able to find some bone at the, uh, between the first premolar and second premolar position, and since we had uh, four millimeters and six millimeters wide, we are going to proceed through this alveolar bone and to reach the really the zygomatic bone. That's uh, our um, procedure to discover, uh, to raise the flap. So we will split the flap in the posterior part in order to maintain close this uh, 
communications. And this is the soft tissue still closing. We, are, we don't like to open it and close it with an artificial membrane. Of course, we prefer to maintain the natural soft tissue of the patient. And then the split uh, flap finishes over here. And then we have a completely flap. We will, of course, go till the nodes over where the cytoma bone meets the frontal bone. And we like to discover the whole thing in order to be able to control all the surgical field. And then we will, uh, uh, the first thing we will use is our uh, very, very nice instrument. We like to use this instrument, which is a very simple pencil. And we will mark, we like to mark our starting point, our finishing point too. We like to mark the anthrostomy point. We don't like to get loose during the surgery. So I'm skipping from the round bar, but you may see we are not opening any window on this maxillary wall. We have the line. We are following the line. We know the anatomy because we did a CCT. So we are reaching the zygomatic bone through this uh, osteotomy. So it's a very, very conservative osteotomy. So you see here, what is the direction of our osteotomy? You may see how we are maintaining the soft tissue closure. This is the line we have painted with our pencil in the maxillary wall. And this is the osteotomy. You see, this is a tunnel, a circular osteotomy tunnel shaded osteotomy. So since it's a round osteotomy, we will use a round implant design. So, and this is the Strauman uh, Sagomatic Saga round design. This means that the section of this implant is a circular one. You may see here, you may appreciate this is a tapered implant and you may feel as I do feel some resistance for the implant to get in. This is because of this tupper design and also because there is a huge difference between the last drill diameter and the implant diameter itself. Our last drill diameter is 2.9 millimeters and the implant diameter is 3.9 millimeters. So it's one millimeter difference. Let's go to the left side now, which is also a quite a complicated side with also holes, it's the same patients. And uh, you may appreciate there are some more communications on the posterior part and also on the anterior. So we, we are facing a challenge patient, especially regarding the soft tissue. But at the end, we were able to find some uh, a bone on uh, some torus, actually buccal torus that we are going to use as you may see here. So we were able to find these torus and then we are going to uh, use them in order to give some support for the soft tissue. We don't like to uh, eliminate the remains of the alveolar uh, bone. We like to preserve remains of alveolar bone. We like to be conservative. The problem of this patient is maxillary atrophy. We like to preserve as much bone as possible. This small amount remain of bone, of alveolar bone, will be very useful for the soft tissue to attach. Fibers from the soft tissue will attach to this bone and will prevent from soft tissue recession. And since this is a class three, this is a type, this is a circular osteotomy. This is a round shaped osteotomy. We are going to use again a round implant. As you may see here, you feel some resistance also because there is a difference between the drill and the implant. And this is the type of implant we choose for this type of anatomy. Round hole, round osteotomy, round implant design accordingly. So at the end, you see what, how is nature, how nature can be surprising for us. This is the one patient and you see the anatomy in on one side is totally different than the anatomy on the other side. 
Here in the right side, we have a type zero anatomy. And then we are proceeding through this alveolar bone because we find out that there was four millimeters height and more than six millimeters wide. So the bone, the alveolar bone remaining is able to embrace the neck of this implant. The, this bone will, together with the implant stability, will achieve osseointegration. integration. And there is nothing better to seal against the bacteria than to have some osseointegration integration in this uh, part. So we are not opening any window. We are preserving as much bone as possible. We try to be very conservative, minimally invasive. And then we are reaching the zygoma stability by uh, using an intrasinusal path. Whereas on the other side, we are doing just the opposite. Our implant gets into the alveolar bone. It flies without touching even the maxillary wall until he reaches the zygomatic bone and gets its stability. Again, because of the nice design of the implant, because it has some threads at this uh, neck level, it will get osseointegration, integration it will get a nice soft tissue ceiling, a nice uh, uh, ceiling, uh, hard tissue ceiling, sorry, and we will get soft tissue ceiling because we are preservating this alveolar bone. This uh, patient was treated in collaboration with Drs. Peter and Madalina Simon, Saga Center, Stuttgart, Germany. And uh, you see the kind of prosthesis they were able to deliver in the next day. And you see the prosthesis after six months, the soft tissue status after six months. So it's a very, very nice soft tissue preservation. And what is best? We are going to compare now the CBCT previous and the CBCT after six months. You see, even though we have um, perforated this bone without making any window, we are, have been able to reach the zygomatic bone. We have been able to maintain sinus uh, uh, integrity. We've been able to maintain a very healthy sinus and also to maintain soft tissue in uh, the buccal part of this implant. So we don't expect to have problems with this implant. On, on the other side, it's the same, but in a different position. We were able to penetrate this bone, this um, torus, and then to place an implant and to maintain this sinus integrity and soft tissue integrity around our implant. So this is how we choose implants, the round design of implant for the round osteotomy, for the circular osteotomy. But what happens when there is no bone enough to perforate? it? What happens when we find out a situation like this one? When we have just one millimeter or less of bone, are we going to penetrate the sinus through this one millimeter thick bone? Probably with time, we will use this bone. With time, we will get a late sinusitis, a late recurrent sinusitis. This patient, if we do that, if we perforate this bone through this, if we perforate this sinus through this very thin bone, we are knocking the door for the problem. We are knocking the door for the sinusitis. So what Saga Concept is recommending you is switch, move your osteotomy to the buccal side. Use this small remain of alveolar bone and convert this millimeter, this single millimeter into seven millimeters of bone contact. This, together with the right implant design, having some threads in this part, will achieve some uh, osseointegration integration that will prevent uh, bacteria to get into the sinus. And of course, you have to maintain sinus lining integrity here, and you have to separate the antrostomy. This means the place where we are getting into the antrum as much as possible from the uh, critical zone. And to explain this, we are going to discuss 
this second patient. You see, this is the three model of the patient. Uh, had the pleasure to perform the surgery of this patient together with my friend, uh, Dr. Guy McLennan. Um, it was a very challenging patient, as you may see. Actually, the most expert I get, the most I'm looking forward to have a 3D model previous to my surgery. So as you may see here, it's a very, very resolved maxilla. You may see the green color transparent through the plastic. And not only that, but also you may see complete holes. It's a patient that uh, she suffered a lot of uh, procedures, implant procedures that of course fail procedures. She still has one uh, implant over here and everything failed in her. So it was a patient really, really challenging. Uh, not only because of the anatomy, but uh, you know these things happen because of his phys uh, psychological character too. So I'm going to uh, use this example to explain you how do we treat type 2 and type 4 uh, situations. So allow me to sh share with you the video, the pre-surgery. There was an implant, uh, anterior implant over there. And the terigoid, you may see how much bone we have there. We must, you must see how this sinus is totally occupied, totally occupied in this left side. And uh, a lot of holes, the communications between the sinus and the nose and the antrum. So not only the sinus, but also the nose was communicated holes everywhere, implants fail, many implants fail. That's the typical story of iatrogenia. Implants that have failed, you see, there and there, a lot of communications. So what, what we should do in a patient like that? She wanted to, um, to have a fixed denture. She was, uh, of course, advised that uh, she has a bigger problem on the, I mean, sinusal problem on the left side. Actually, we have to make a special uh, uh, consent for her. So let's uh, discuss the right anterior position, which is this one. So that's the plane, the inclined plane, where we are thinking we are going to place the implant that it will go more or less around the canine position, the right canine position. So for us, this is a class two uh, classification where uh, most of the implant is going to be outside. We have some bone left over here and we will try to sink the implant in this bone. We don't want to penetrate over here because we know that in the future we will have a communication, an oral ultra communication, and this means a sinusitis. And this is the position of the second premolar where we are planning to place our posterior implant. As you may see, there is some uh, uh, occupation uh, over here. I, it looks like a mucous cyst, uh, but the bone at this place is not so thick. It's about one millimeter thick. And let's go for the left side in the anterior part. This is the canine position, you see there is a big hole, the remind of a, a loose implant over there. The whole sinus is occupe, totally occupe, and this is what we think we are going to, where we think we are going to place our zygomatic implant, anterior implant. And this is the posterior position. We have to go through this bone, and uh, we have already the sinusitis. So really a challenging patient. Uh, of course, the patient had to agree that uh, she may need the uh, intervention of an ENT surgeon after the surgery, but uh, she agreed with that, so we proceed with the surgery. So remember that we have several communications, and again, we should split our flat, our flap in order to leave the soft tissue closing those communications. Please don't make a full thickness flap. Split your flap, at least in this part, and then you will be able to have a full 
flap in order to control the whole situation. You may see a detail of the soft tissue closing those communications that we left there. So is the natural soft tissue still closing the hole? As we've seen previously, we will use this uh, lateral cutting board in order to make a small canal where the tail of our round bar will slide back and forward. Usually we cut when we go back and not forward. We do that like is very smoothly, very smoothly. And we are going to perform first the um, osteotomy that is close to the eye. So this means we place, first, we <coughs> perform first the anterior osteotomy. Once the anterior osteotomy is placed, I like to leave one uh, of my uh, twist drills in, in order to get some orientation. I like to spread my implants as much as possible in order to get an AP distribution, the best distribution I can. This will decrease the uh, cantilever. So, I will start in the same position, making a nice canal where the drill will slide, smoothly slide. And so we have now both osteotomies, the anterior and the posterior. You see, you maybe are able to notice now that we haven't cut any bone that we don't need to cut. We are very, very conservative. We just try to make a canal in this case, because we cannot make a tunnel. So a canal means that there is uh, there is no roof. We have floor, lateral walls, but no roof. So we make a canal. So we need a canal shape implant design. We need a canal section to fill out this osteotomy. So this is the moment where we are placing this Strowman Saga flat implant in this canal. And you see the Saga flat implant is placed in the posterior position, and now we are placing the anterior implant in order in the reverse order. So you may see that the flat implant is offering a very extended and flat surface against soft tissue. It is not going to compromise soft tissue vascularization. So the possibility to jeopardize soft tissue vascularization and to get a soft tissue recession is diminished, not only by the type of osteotomy, but also for, by the type of implant design, by the type of implant section. Whereas in the anterior implant, we almost made a tunnel Almost, we don't have total roof, but you may see this distance is inferior than the middle implant distance. So, and then we place a round implant. This uh, threaded part will be able to seal this entrance and we will get a nice osseointegration integration there also. And remember that this part of the implant or the flat implant has some micro, sorry, micro threads that we able to maintain this bone as uh, Antonio, uh, as Andres uh, Montero told you. So let's uh, go for the left side now. The first thing we are going to do, as I told you, is to mark. We like to mark, we like not to get loose. So we mark first the alveolar starting point, and then we mark the antrostomy point where the place we are getting into the antrum and the same on the posterior implant. So remember, this is a very acute zone, uh, uh, sinus, and this is a type two. We are able, we would like to preserve as much bone as possible over there. So we are just uh, grinding back, grinding back until we are able to sink our implant as much as possible. Once we get this, we go for the posterior. And again, you see, we cannot penetrate over here. What the Saga concept says is, please adapt to the anatomy of this patient because we know that if we perform a hole over here, if we perform our osteotomy in this position, we are knocking the door for a sinus problem in the late future. So instead of that, we move outside, we grind this, bone 
and we try to penetrate, to sink our implant as much as possible. And if we do this technique together with the right implant design, we will be, we will be able to get this kind of results. This implant is not offering any compromise. This is not compromising the soft tissue vascularity at this point. It will be very uh, uh, gentle with uh, our soft tissue. So this is the aspect at the end of the surgery with this very, very challenging patient. That's the uh, provisional prosthesis that was placed the day after. And this is the soft tissue uh, image after six months at the moment of the uh, final prosthesis installation. We have some very nice images now to share with you. So this is the patient, as you may see, this is how we plan the, uh, anti uh, the posterior right implant. So this is the place of the second premolar. This is the implant in place. And this is the CBCT six months after the implant placement. As you may see here, the sinus is very nice, even better than the beginning. Now we go to the canine position, right canine position, class two, and we were planning to place the implant in this direction. This is the implant in place, and you may see six months after, which is the result. Uh, but let's go to the amazing left side. So this is where we were planning, remember? There was a hole of a failed uh, regular implant. And you may see here how total sinus is plenty of mucus. We place our implant and look at this, six months after. That's the same position. You may check there, there. So this is the same position for our CBCT and we, I'm a, I must to be honest with you, I don't know exactly the reason for this. Maybe we were very conservative in our osteotomy. I don't know, I don't really know why. But this is the result. Six months after, it's like if we treated surgically, treated by zygomatic implants this sinus. And not only that, but also look at this bone. Uh, look at the uh, place where the implant was uh, failed. Now we get better bone in this position too. And this is the second premolar left side. This is the previous image, totally occupied sinus, the uh, implant in place. So, and this is our <laughs> implant zygomatic uh, sinus implant treatment. So you may see now we have a better sinus that we started at the beginning, six months, the sinus is completely healed. It's not worse, but it's on the opposite. It's totally healed. So, and this is the beauty of this zygomatic implant system. This is the beauty of the Saga concept. Saga concept is about patient specific zygomatic therapy. A therapy that we are going to individualize according to the anatomy of each patient. We don't want the patient to adapt to our technique, surgeon's technique. I do always intrasinus, I do always extrasinus. No, please. We should adapt to the patient. And following this line of thinking, following this rationale, we also need patient specific tools. And that's the beauty again of this trauma psychomatic implant system. To me, this is the only system today that is able to match the osteotomy type with the implant design. And with this uh, patient treatment made in collaboration with doctors uh, Will McLean, Ophir uh, Fromovic and Natalia Barlenga from uh, Saga Center Barcelona. I like to thank you all of you uh, for being here. And now uh, I'm going to introduce you the next session, which is the frequent flyer session. So now we will have the pleasure to count with the Strawman team in order to answer your questions related to 
the logistics of how to uh, get this uh, magnificent uh, uh, implant portfolio. And they are very open guys. So please uh, ask whatever you would like to ask. So with this, I give the opportunity and I take the profit of the opportunity to thank uh, Colin Harder to be with us again. And uh, also Andres Montero for being so nice. So, so capable to explain us all the futures of this implant. And I'd like also to congratulate the whole Strongman team, including Thomas, which is not here, unfortunately, and the ones that uh, were in the past and are not in the at this moment also, because this is a very special moment for all of us. Thank you again for giving us this opportunity uh, to explain uh, the beauty of this sagamatic implant system uh, to the Strongman team. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Huh? Um, yes, um, it was really, uh, again, super interesting to listen to your um, presentation. Always uh, learn a lot. Um, yes, I have also mentioned it uh, in, in, in my part uh, that uh, we are simply pleased to work uh, in such an important uh, area, which is for really patients who are almost hopeless and that we as a company can rely on your expertise, uh, Carlos, this is uh, this is really fantastic. Um, also, thanks, uh, David, uh, for organizing everything. Um, we really appreciate this collaboration. So I have with me uh, Andres Montero, who is our product manager, global product manager, bringing uh, this exciting project to the market. Um, yes, and uh, there might be some questions from uh, from your um, from the audience. As uh, we also realized that uh, Straumann, is it all clear or some technical question? Um, Carlos, is all fine? I think uh, they may maybe ask you by using the chat, maybe. Okay, I will ask you something because uh, if I imagine I am a customer, what should I do to get this kind of implants? Should I call my local uh, rep of, of the Stroman? What should I do? do, that, do that's I get exact tomorrow or should I wait a lot? Um, Andres, if you want to answer, but I can. Yeah, of course. Yes, sure. Thank you, Holger. Uh, Carlos, uh, just as well, one quick thank you from my side. It was really a pleasure to, to join the, this event. And thank you so much for organizing and giving us the opportunity to present the implants to the whole alumni of the saga. It's a con true pleasure. In order to answer the question uh, correct, Carlos, the, what we need to do is the first to understand that we are uh, 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 in the first phase of the commercialization of the implants at a global level. So we, we need to consider the, f the countries that uh, we have registered the implant, which is a major market. So in, in North America, Canada and the US is registered and in Europe is also registered. Um, so uh, what is important then is to exactly do that, Loc uh, contact your local Strauman uh, representative of your of your country and uh, make sure that you have the right uh, information and connect and connection with them. Exactly. I think it's a it's a it's a great privilege. Eh? And I said that also in my presentation that uh, it's it's all of you who have experience with uh, psychomatic implants since years. It's it's lesser on us. Huh? So so we jumped on this because we have seen that there is no meaningful innovations, but innovations are needed, and uh, we have been privileged to collaborate with you. Uh, this means that some of the participations of of this event they are not in contact with Stroman so far. So also if you don't have, let's say, an access point to the Strauman people, uh, please, uh, um, you can shoot wherever you want emails and I expect my organization to be uh, speedy with you in contact because we all know that, uh, that uh, whoever runs a Saga Center or is part of the community is an super important contact to us. Uh, so we really appreciate to collaborate with you. And if, if 
nothing works at the end. Uh, it's very easy. Uh, Holger.hadera at Straumann.com. You can shoot me personally an email. We, we, we hunt after each and every opportunity. Uh, you can be sure. Yes, uh, so as Andre said, uh, we, are, we are really happy that the product is also gets cleared in, in North America. We have to be fair, so, the, so the, the first official presentations will take place in exactly one week from now. But uh, I can tell you that uh, it was uh, important for uh, Carlos and David, and if it's important for the two of them, uh, that we presented this one uh, this a week earlier with you, uh, we, we saw it as a great opportunity and a great honor. So if you give us a few days, huh, then I think we will be ready also to, to uh, equip finally. We have a question from Dr. Leslie David. Yes, and I tried to answer. Yeah. The question from Leslie is about, is the patient available in Canada? Yep. Yeah, yeah, this is what, uh, so in a few days from now, there is, uh, on next Friday, there is a kind of a starting point. Um, to be fully transparent, as Andre said, that uh, this is now an early phase. It's it's not the full market release. So we have only, let's say, an, a selected amount of, of kits available. But uh, it's also not like this that we go now wild. Uh, it's uh, not like this. You will not read this in million articles, etc. We are very, let's say, it's a sniper, a sniper approach. So it's today and it's uh, next Friday. And that's it for the next weeks to come uh, because uh, yeah we need need uh, to fulfill uh, also your expectations that we can deliver when we are promising and and therefore we keep it uh, rather small in the beginning yeah. okay um yeah, i have a question for you <laughs> no of course yeah. no it's a very no, it's not a tricky question it's a very simple one do you have any preference of the designs between the designs, the round or the flat, or, or would you better use it according to the uh, Yeah, so um, I suppose some of the more challenging ones, I, I, I find that the, um, on a quad side game, often the anterior one is, is a more challenging implant to place. Uh, and the Zaga round, um, has been has, has made a lot easier uh, and actually positioning uh, and trying to keep the implant sitting against the the maxillary bone uh, with the the design of the um, of the carrier mount has actually made that a lot easier. So I've, and I've, from my anterior, I've only done the Zaga round. The Zaga flat on the posterior, I like I like the concept of it. Um, and again, they tend to be a slightly easier implant to place in in my opinion. So um, and I yeah. On singles, when I place them, they've been nice and straightforward to place. I would say, on a technical point of view, um, the one thing you have to be a little bit careful is uh, over preparation of the, of the sites. And uh, so, at the moment, I'm currently using a, a step drill, um, which is a little bit narrower, um, so that uh, when I'm placing the implant, the if you use a 2.9. Um, I think it's too wide sometimes for the implant. Um, so I'm using a narrower step drill uh, and I find that that's a little bit easier. Uh, and then I might have to go back and use the 2.7 or 2.9. Um, but yeah, so out of preference, I found the rounds have made my life easier with quads. Uh, uh, so yeah, that, that would be my preference. And uh, do you think that uh, with these two types of implants, you know, you get uh, satisfied with uh, with uh, implant design, or would you need another type of implant? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good question. In my in my implant armamentarium, I suppose, I always have uh, some of the older implants. In other words, the standard threaded uh, implants on regular size. And the reason I do that is because if I was to not get stability, not get primary stability, uh, then I would then go ahead and place a larger implant. Now, so far uh, with the Zaga implants, I've not had to do that. So, um, but I would always keep that in reserve. I suppose same as normal implants. If I was placing a conventional implant for all on four, if I didn't get stability, you either have to go longer or, or wider. Uh, so to have something wider as a, as a reserve is what I've done so far, but I've not had to use it. So my experience so far is that uh, uh, I've got good stability. 
Well, I got a question for me. It's about the length of the implants. Uh, you know, um, it is uh, for measuring the length of the implants, we go through the osteotomy and we use what goes for this. And what we use also is uh, we put our finger outside the mouth of the, of the face. And so at this moment, we try to feel the ghost through the osteotomy, pushing the skin, because I like to go always through the zygomatic bone. Uh, so it may happen that depending on the patient facial architecture of facial constitution, we have a skinny patient or a more um, fatty uh, face patient. Uh, if the patient is very skinny, you will feel very quickly. And usually you don't need to, uh, you, you will feel it very quick. And it is in my hands easier to be very precise. We like to be always about a couple of three millimeters outside because the implant is placed in this oblique uh, position. So we like uh, to get as much contact as possible, especially on those uh, patients where the bone, the zygomatic bone is not so hard. So in those patients, I like to go through and to take as much possible uh, profit as possible of this uh, uh, engineering or the taper engineering of of the implant. That's why also I don't like to, to cut bone on the facial side because I'm losing some of the power of the of the uh, uh, temper design if we take uh, out some bone of the fa on the facial side also. So hopefully I'm uh, answering the question. So I try to be as much precise as possible, but of course, sometimes I make mistakes. Uh, Carlos, Carlos, can I maybe direct one one to you? Then? <laughs> Is it, uh, going I back I to the question yeah. that uh, that Leslie's asked you. I don't know if you've seen that. So it's saying, are, are you grafting lateral to the implants? Um, so whether, whether you use any any grafting, and the reason I ask is because, as you know, I, I tend to graft both medial and lateral mm -hmm. to my my implants to if my, my ideal would be to have an implant that's completely encased in bone from, from apex to the coronal section is, is the ideal, you know, for any implant, whether it be zygoma or, or any implant. And, um, but also I, I know with it comes an inherent risk. Whenever we graft, we have the risk of uh, graft failure and graft success. So um, I suppose for me, uh, it'd be interested to know your, your thoughts on that because obviously much more experienced and probably probably been there and, had the complications. Not really the theory. I think, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. I would like also to sink my implant and have it uh, surrounded, totally surrounded by bone. I think uh, uh, we, as a dentist, we have our mentality that uh, we don't like to see uh, titanium and. Uh, we try always to cover the titanium with uh, everything or anything like uh, some uh, white power or membranes or whatever we have in our uh, desk. And uh, but uh, we have to accept that this uh, the anatomy of the maxilla is totally different to the alveolar. So it's. Uh, it's a different situation, and we, we have to know it, to know how much it may vary from one patient to the other, and we should take as much profit as possible to this anatomy. So my idea is to reverse, so to, to make a problem, to convert a problem into an advantage. So it's a matter of sitting down, uh, understanding, preparing the case, as uh, you see, uh, the most experienced we are, the most we uh, uh, ask for, for 3D models, uh, CBCT. Uh, 
So everything understood previous to the surgery and then go to the surgery with a very clear rationale of what we are going to do. That's the, the, the recommendation I would, I would suggest to, to everybody that is uh, hearing us now. So hopefully I answered your question. I know that this is a very difficult one to answer. But uh, with this, I think uh, we may say uh, thanks again to all of us, to all the ones that are listening to us. Allow me to do this. So Captain is saying <laughs> goodbye again. Thank you for the co-pilots, for all the crew of this flight. Uh, it's been uh, amazing, really amazing for us to be today here because it is uh, the moment we are just not uh, taking up, but landing. This is a very special moment for us, really, really, really. And I thank you for all for your support and the ones that are on the other side of the screen for being here. You know, those uh, saga centers are our spirit. The starting of this project has been uh, uh, very challenging also. This has been, uh, you know, when you start with a project like this, you are, uh, I'm joking with, with that, but you are like selling smoke, you, you, you're selling something abstract. So I thank you very much to those ones that were the first ones in raising the hand saying, I want to be there. I want to make a task force of uh, professionals looking forward to improve our treatment, to teach each other, to communicate, to collaborate each other. And at the end, this is going to be good for us, of course, and good for the patient. And this is the final goal of this network Saga Center. So thank all of you for being here, especially because you are the first ones and now the project is going to be like with big speed now. So thanks again, thanks. Thank you. Thank Congrats, you. Huh? Be Thank proud you. to Carlos, huh? you must be proud and you can be proud. Enjoy your evening. Huh? Thank you. Enjoy Thank you. your weekend too. Thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.